Let's cut the Earth in half. You can see all of its layers. Here's the inner core. It's about 40 times hotter than the inside of your oven. That's the mantle, an ocean of hot lava. Here comes the crust of the Earth, the solid surface on which our civilization lives. But if you look up, there are many layers besides the atmosphere and the ozone layer. Scientists recently discovered a strange bubble here, which protects our planet from radiation. And nope, it's not the Earth's magnetic field. This bubble is made of radio waves. Our planet grows like a Christmas tree in the radio spectrum. But we're interested in low-frequency waves, the ones that let us keep in touch with submarines. So, radio waves are like light waves, or regular ocean waves. Look at this one. The distance between the two peaks is the wavelength, and the number of these waves over a period of time is the frequency. For example, there are 10 waves in this interval of one second. So, can you guess the frequency of this wave? Yep, it's 10 hertz. Cell phones use waves with a frequency of 300 to 3000 megahertz. So, add six more zeros to that number. But waves of that frequency don't penetrate barriers well. Think of how you lose your cell phone connection when you're driving through a tunnel. That's because there is metal inside. It's a conductive material that weakens the radio waves a lot. Salt water is also a kind of conductor. So, if the submarine is deep enough, the thick layer of water weakens the signal and we lose communication. To maintain it, we send fewer waves but make them longer. In the same amount of time, the frequency of the short waves will be much higher than the frequency of the long waves. That's why they're called very low frequency waves. But as it turns out, these waves travel all over the Earth and even into space. This is where things get interesting. The waves collide with particles of radiation from the sun. We think of the sun as a friendly giant giving us light and heat but it actually emits a lot of harmful radiation. Each flare, or the electrical discharge of material on our home star, causes an even greater burst of radiation. These particles fly to our planet, just as radio waves do. They travel 93 million miles from the sun to Earth in eight minutes and crash into our bubble, which acts as a shield. Basically, radiation particles from the sun accumulate in the radiation belts around the Earth. Our planet's magnetic field traps them, and a recently discovered bubble of very low-frequency waves lies right below this radiation belt. It helps us repel some of the harmful emissions. Analysis of old studies confirmed that the radiation belts used to be much lower and closer to Earth. But when our civilization began to use radio actively, our waves raised that belt higher. No one expected such an effect from simple radio waves, but it'll give us a way to protect astronauts in the future. When you're on Earth, its magnetic field keeps you safe from radiation. You can physically see it when charged solar wind particles make the air particles at the poles of our planet glow. This is an aurora. Next time you admire this beauty, know that it's actually the Earth saving you from some extremely harmful rays. But if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, somewhere in space, I have bad news for you. Nothing protects you there. This is a big problem for astronauts, who spend months on the International Space Station. Perhaps scientists will learn to create protective bubbles of very low-frequency waves around space stations and spacecraft. The same is true for other planets. We're probably going to colonize Mars. There is no magnetic field there, and nothing can protect you from radiation. But if you create an artificial bubble there, you can reduce the harmful radiation. Another invisible bubble protecting us is the atmosphere. It's like a layer cake or an onion. Each level of the atmosphere has its own properties. The lowest layer that we live in is the troposphere. This layer contains 80% of the weight of all the air on the planet. It's also the main place where water vapor lives. And this is where the machine called weather works. The sun sends rays of energy to the Earth. Our planet's surface reflects them and heats the air in the troposphere. This makes it move and change places with the cold air. So all the wind, cyclones, storms, and tornadoes only happen in the troposphere, up to about 7.5 miles high. That's why commercial planes fly at an altitude of around 6 miles. The wind or other bad weather conditions hardly affect this area, and the air here is not as dense as it is down on Earth. Flying one mile above sea level is like moving through a biscuit. It's hard, but at a 6-mile altitude, flying feels like moving through light whipped cream. The plane almost feels no resistance, so it's a win-win. They save fuel and keep the passengers safe. 
A couple of significant downsides are that it's very cold, and you can't breathe there. It's cold because there are very few air molecules to absorb heat from the ground and transfer it to each other. You wouldn't be able to breathe here for the same reason. That's why planes are equipped with oxygen masks, just in case. Let's go a little here. This is the stratosphere. There's even fewer air molecules up here, and that's where the weather probes fly. They're the kind of small balloons with computers people use to predict the weather. This part of the atmosphere also contains the well-known ozone layer. This is our shield against harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone is almost the same as oxygen, except it has three atoms in it. When harmful ultraviolet rays enter our atmosphere, they crash into the O3 molecule. The ray breaks the molecule into O2 and another oxygen atom. The ray itself is converted into heat, but the ozone regenerates quickly. A single oxygen atom joins the O2, and the ozone molecule is ready to protect us again. It's the invisible shield that protects us from radiation. It gave birth to all life on Earth. As our civilization developed, we started to emit freon gas into the atmosphere. We used to fill our old refrigerators with it. A single chlorine atom would detach from a freon molecule when in the air, and then it would bind a single oxygen atom. Now, the ozone can't regenerate like it used to. Fortunately, we banned the use of such harmful gases and the ozone layer began to regenerate. Scientists expect it to fully recover in the middle of the 21st century. The stratosphere ends at about 31 miles. The next layer is the mesosphere, the coldest of them all. On average, it's about negative 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five times colder than your freezer. This is the layer of the atmosphere where incoming meteors start to ignite because of friction in the air. Then they will eventually burn up completely. The air here is too thin for airplanes or balloons to fly, but it's still too dense for satellites. So, this layer of the atmosphere is not well studied. The next layer extends from 55 miles above sea level to about 500. That's a little more than the distance between Las Vegas and San Francisco. Carmen Line is situated in this layer of the atmosphere. This is the boundary between our planet and space. The thermosphere is where all our spacecraft and satellites fly. It's also home to the International Space Station. The temperature rises extremely. The air here is about 10 times hotter than your oven can produce. It's all due to solar activity. But you would never be able to feel this heat. The air molecules that carry the heat here are so small that you would literally float between them. Imagine a giant pool with only three drops of water. That's the thermosphere. And the highest layer of our atmosphere is the exosphere. This is the widest layer of our air bubble. Scientists believe its boundaries are about halfway to the moon at 120,000 miles. This is the point where the pressure of solar radiation begins to exceed the Earth's gravity. It's still part of our atmosphere. This means that astronauts who went on various space missions and have been on the ISS have actually never left the Earth's atmosphere. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, 
and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the giant crystal cave, AKA the cave of the crystals in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. 
But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. But thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. The near future. Our planet is running out of energy sources, and the human population is growing. There's less free space on Earth every year. People have to move to other planets as soon as possible. But there isn't enough energy for spaceships and interstellar voyages. You're a member of a group of scientists searching for energy sources in the universe. Solar power, windmills, hydro, and thermal power plants. It's not enough. You offer an adventurous but risky idea. You want to create an object and accelerate it to the speed of light. This object will start generating infinite energy. Other scientists immediately reject this idea. Such an experiment can destroy the entire planet and even the solar system. If something moves faster than light particles, it creates a black hole. To reduce the risks, you suggest speeding up a small and thin object, like a simple needle. As soon as it reaches the speed of light and releases energy, special machines similar to solar panels will absorb this energy. Only one millisecond of moving at the speed of light will be enough for humanity. Then the needle should be stopped. You suggest to slow it down with the help of Mount Everest. You want the needle to smash into it. As soon as you start working on the experiment, you face an unsolvable problem. An ordinary needle, like any other object with mass, can't reach the speed of light. According to the laws of physics, it's impossible. To do this, you need to turn the needle into a beam of photons. The metal of the needle will be erased into dust during acceleration to the speed of light. Earth's atmosphere shows strong resistance to a moving object. So now, you need to create the strongest durable material in the universe. It not only has to withstand the air resistance, but also not be torn apart by the energy growing in it. When any object increases its speed, its energy increases too. You need a lot of money to create such a needle. But before you get it, you have to conduct this experiment in a simulation program to prove you're doing the right thing. This program is a computer hologram of the solar system. The program imitates and visualizes all the laws of physics. You can run your experiment using this model, and if it goes well, you'll get money to implement your plan. So, you create a computer simulation of the needle. Then, you build a machine with an incredibly powerful engine. It works like a rocket. Several motors are attached to the needle. They help reach the speed of sound, then charge the needle with energy and release it. Using the charge force, the needle should accelerate to the speed of light and crash into Everest. You'd need to set the launch spot of the needle a long way from the mountain for the whole operation to work out. Air resistance greatly hinders the acceleration. The needle's path must pass through thousands of miles of free space. You decide that it's better to launch the experiment from space, where there's no resistance. To do this, you build a base on the moon in the simulation. Computers calculate the exact start time and needle position. You need to know the speed of the Earth's movement around its axis and the Moon's movement around our planet. The slightest deviation from the course can cause the needle to crash into the ocean or a city. If it gets into the water, severe floods and tsunamis will happen all around the world. The computer calculates the ideal moment for the needle to fly. 
you're ready to start the operation. Scientists and presidents of different countries are watching the simulation. You're so nervous, you're sweating. You come up to the computer and press the start button. Everyone is looking at the big screen. A rocket with a needle placed on top flies up. It's rising high above the moon. It reaches the speed of sound. The first engine falls off. The rocket's mass decreases and its speed increases. Half the distance between our planet and the moon is gone. There's two engine turbines left. The speed of sound is exceeded by 10 times. The second engine falls off. The needle is approaching the Earth's atmosphere. The third engine generates a huge charge of energy, strikes it into the needle, and flies away. The needle turns bright red and hot like the sun. It penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. The protective layers of our planet can't prevent the needle from reaching its goal. The sky lights up with a bright flash. In the next half second, the needle will hit Everest at the speed of light. Two seconds later, your experiment will fail. And here's why. The greater the speed of any object, the larger the mass and the amount of energy that accumulates inside. When the needle reaches the speed of light, its energy begins to increase indefinitely. The mass grows to infinity. And when this happens, a black hole is formed, a massive object with an incredible gravitational force that absorbs absolutely everything, even light particles, photons, and the time dimension. This is called the event horizon. Literally, everything that is an event, time, space, matter, is absorbed by the black hole. No one knows what is inside the black hole. After one millisecond, the needle almost reaches the speed of light. It releases a huge amount of energy into the atmosphere. If you look at it in slow motion, you can see how the air is ionized. That is, the air molecules are split. In nature, this process occurs during lightning flashes. Our sun also has ionizing energy and disinfects the air. The needle cuts through the Earth's atmosphere. The sky is lit up with a bright light. All the clouds and every water molecule around the needle instantly evaporate at the high temperature. The sky becomes crystal clear hundreds of miles around the spot. In the center of this clean circle is the needle, and it's approaching Mount Everest. Hundreds of thousands of tons of snow burn up as soon as the needle gets close to it. It has reached the speed of light. A thick layer of ground melts and flies away in different directions. It looks like someone has thrown a spear into an ice cream mountain. Everest can't handle so much energy and is torn apart into a million pieces like a sandcastle. The incredible power of the blast wave destroys everything around. Stone, wood, soil, leaves, concrete, everything falls apart into billions of pieces because of the powerful energy and heat. Then, all these molecules are erased. The needle moves faster than photons, and as soon as it overtakes the light, it starts to overtake time. From the needle's point of view, all events begin to go in reverse. The mass of the needle becomes infinite, and the greater the mass, the greater the energy. A burst of unthinkable gravitational force absorbs all space. Land, trees, nearby cities, the Earth's crust, and the core, everything disappears in a matter of seconds. A black hole absorbs light and time. An absolute black void has come. The black hole is growing. Holographic International Space Station is shrinking thanks to the strong pressure of gravity and is being pulled into a black void. Then it's the moon's turn. The force of gravity increases quickly. The hole is getting heavier and more massive. All the planets of the solar system collapse as the gravitational black giant grows. The sunlight goes in and never comes back. The black hole becomes thousands of times heavier than the sun. Our star splits into millions of thin strips of light, like spaghetti, and spits out powerful streams of energy. An empty sector of outer space with an expanding black hole is in the place where our solar system was just moments ago. Meteorites flying past it also fall into the trap. Just one small needle managed to cause such a disaster. The simulation ends. The program breaks down because it can't calculate further events. You realize it was a bad idea after all. You decide you'll try to get the energy from the Earth's core instead. Have you ever wondered how the world will go down in flames? Will it be due to zombies, extraterrestrial civilizations, or AI taking over? Nah, turns out it might actually be mosquitoes and scientists causing the chaos. 
It's funny how things created by nature aren't as threatening as the stuff that doesn't exist naturally. And you know what's on that list? Editing the DNA genome. Experiments with the genetic structure of living organisms can produce completely new species, and no one knows how nature will react to them. Let's look at an example of gene drive. So it all started with malaria mosquitoes. To somehow stop the growth of their population and prevent the spread of malaria, scientists created a gene that magically made mosquitoes only have male offspring. Several insects with this gene transmitted it to others during the mating season and thus spread infertility. Scientists were able to stop malaria and destroy almost the entire mosquito population. But imagine if something went wrong in the mosquito genome and their population began to increase exponentially. Malaria could spread across all continents and create huge problems for all of us. Now let's move from the little mosquito problem to a planetary disaster that can be caused by the desire for knowledge, which is deeply embedded in our nature. British cosmologist Martin Rees once said that we lived in the first century when human beings could determine the planet's future. It seems that it's so easy not to destroy yourself, but our nature is quite complicated. In pursuit of solving the mysteries of the universe, we have built a giant machine that, according to some people, may destroy our planet. And this device is the Large Hadron Collider. The main task of this giant machine is to accelerate particles and make them collide with one another. Scientists expect that the collider will help better understand the structure of our universe. In simple words, this is a miniature simulator of the universe. Using it may also shed light on the mystery of dark matter. During operation, the machine compresses atoms and makes them crash into one another at great speed. Perhaps this is how our universe appeared. Some people fear that a small black hole may form because of this collision. A tiny particle with a huge weight will pull all objects inside itself. Its mass will grow, but its size won't change much. As a result, it will compress the entire Earth and turn it into a ball measuring a little more than 300 feet across. At the same time, our planet will still have the same weight. A powerful gravitational pull on such a small area of matter can form a black hole that might later swallow up our entire solar system. There are also theories that the Hadron Collider could open a portal to a parallel universe with creepy monsters that would enter our world. But of course, such theories have little to do with science. Scientists have already launched the collider several times, and as you can see, nothing terrible has happened. But there is a small nuance. With each launch, scientists increase the speed of particles. Who knows what will happen when they accelerate them too much? According to Martin Rees, the probability that Earth will become a black hole is very, very small. Particles with a much larger energy charge fly in space faster than in the Hadron Collider, and nothing catastrophic happens. Okay, now let's go back to our genomic games to see what else can happen if we continue experimenting with nature. The main problem might be an imbalance in ecosystems. In the 19th century, sailors accidentally brought mice to Gough Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Rodents had no dangerous enemies there, so their population began to grow. Mice began to displace dozens of birds from their home. The rodents attacked the chicks and reduced the population of entire species. Trying to save the birds, scientists decided to get rid of the mice. But these little creatures still managed to survive. As a result, the balance of the whole ecosystem was disrupted. Using gene drive to get rid of one species can lead to uncontrolled population growth of another. Imagine that malaria mosquitoes controlled the population of some flies. And what would happen if these flies lost their main natural enemy? The population of these flies would start destroying other species, and it would begin a chain of destructive events. All this suggests that playing with things that don't exist in nature is very dangerous. We worry a lot about how artificial intelligence can take over the world and eliminate us. Still, at the same time, we don't pay attention to our actions. Genome editing can lead to positive consequences, such as the appearance of healthier people and destructive ones, like the creation of artificial bacteria that can cause serious health problems. 
In general, destroying other species is a trait inherent in humans. Because of our actions, many animals have disappeared from the face of the Earth. Moreover, we even destroy each other. Such aggressive behavior is our nature. And artificial intelligence doesn't have anthropomorphic properties. Its logic may be completely different from ours, and instead of destroying people, it might strive to save them. And we have something to save us from. Remember the giant asteroid that erased more than half of the living creatures on Earth? The fall of the space rock caused a massive blast wave, a tsunami, earthquakes, and dust clouds that covered the sun. Dinosaurs and other animals couldn't survive in such conditions. But what if something similar happens these days? Fortunately, we're better prepared than dinosaurs. Firstly, we have the technology to track giant meteorites and calculate their trajectory. And artificial intelligence can also help us with this. Secondly, we can destroy an asteroid before it reaches us. Several powerful rockets will quickly deal with any space rock and turn it into cosmic dust. Moreover, we will know in advance about its approach. But suppose that a huge stone the size of dozens of Everests will fly towards us. In that case, humanity should hurry with Mars colonization. But don't worry. Observing the sky shows that large asteroids capable of causing severe damage to our planet are moving in a different direction. The most giant known asteroid that could collide with Earth might do so in 2088. The probability that it will fall on our planet is 1 in 50,000, so you shouldn't have to worry about threats from outer space. What lies in the bowels of our planet is much more dangerous. Millions of tons of magma and hot gases can burst to the surface through destructive volcanic eruptions. More than 70,000 years ago, a large-scale eruption threw a tremendous amount of ash into the air, which then floated in the atmosphere in the form of a giant gray cloud for a long time. As a result, Earth's surface cooled down by several degrees, which led to one of the most massive extinctions in the history of our planet. Some eruptions happen not only inside volcanoes. There's such a thing as flood basalt. A colossal magma bubble accumulates under a vast area and begins to seep through faults in different parts. Magma slowly goes out there for many years and destroys all living things around. And the worst thing about this situation is that we can't do anything about it. Humanity has learned to track meteorites in space, but we're still not good at predicting a volcano's behavior. Even if we find out that some giant rock will wake up in the next six months, there's nothing we can do about that. We won't be able to prevent an eruption. All we can do is evacuate people from dangerous territory. We have no protection against earthquakes, and even more so, we can't stop the emission of ash into the atmosphere. It's possible that artificial intelligence will help us with this in the future, but right now, we are powerless. As you can see, there are several options for the end of the world for humanity, and they're all slightly different from those imposed by pop culture and the media. In the end, is it right to look for threats from space or artificial intelligence? Look at this spatula. Just a regular tool, mix and spread ingredients, right? But wait, this one is floating in space for some reason. So there's this astronaut named Pierce Sellers. There he is. He's up there in space, just doing his thing, when all of a sudden, he accidentally drops his trusty spatula. Let me give you some context. This all happened during the Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-121 flight back in 2006. They were on their way to the ISS on a mission to test out some new safety techniques. And now this spatula is just a tiny drop in the ocean of space debris. Humans have been exploring space for, like, over half a century now. We've left all kinds of random stuff up there, from itty-bitty bolts to entire space stations. We've chucked a ton of things into the great beyond. Most of it burns up in a spectacular blaze as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. But some bigger pieces can be a real danger for astronauts and their fancy spacecraft. Like, imagine accidentally crashing into a massive hunk of space junk. There are other weird things found in space. In November 2008, astronaut Heidi Stefanischon Piper was out on a spacewalk trying to fix a jammed gear on a solar panel. Suddenly, she lost her grip on the bag, 
that bag weighed around 30 pounds and was filled with all sorts of cool stuff, like grease devices, a scraper tool, and bags for debris. And it was pretty pricey for a tool bag. It cost around $100,000. Sometime later, amateur astronomers spotted the bag floating around in space. If you're in North America, you can even check if the tool bag is passing through your little slice of the sky. Just hop on over to spaceweather.com's satellite tracker and see if you can catch a glimpse of this interstellar tool bag. By the way, if you need to twist some wires in space and you don't have pliers, well, you may stumble upon them as they're free-floating in space too. Back in the day, when astronauts were just getting their space groove on, they tended to misplace things up there. During his first spacewalk on the Gemini 4 flight in 1965, Ed White, a famous spacewalker, accidentally let go of his glove. That glove decided to have its own adventure and hung out in orbit for a whole month before getting roasted in Earth's atmosphere. So not all debris is there to stay after all. So space junk is basically all the stuff floating around in space that humans have left behind. Before we got all curious and started exploring, there wasn't any space debris hanging around. Imagine space junk as a little kid who just learned how to walk and play with their own toys. When they couldn't walk yet, it was easy for the person watching them to keep the play area clean. They were in charge of taking out the toys and putting them away. But now that the kids can walk, they can grab as many toys as they want and make a huge mess on the carpet. Well, it's kind of the same with us humans exploring outer space. We've sent all sorts of cool gadgets, like cameras, rovers, and rockets to check out what's out there. But we haven't really thought about bringing them back to Earth. And that's where the problem comes in. All this space junk floating around could mess up outer space and even our planet. When we think about outer space, we often imagine vast open spaces that are yet to be fully explored humans have only discovered a tiny 5% of the universe. But here's something they might not always consider. The impact of all the cool gadgets they send out there. Believe it or not, as of May 2022, we've got more than 5,000 satellites orbiting Earth. Over 5,000 opportunities for these machines to go haywire, get lost in space, or even worse, create a bunch of debris that could harm both outer space and our lovely planet. There's at least 3,000 satellites just hanging around up there, not doing anything useful, and nobody seems to be bothered about bringing them back home. And what if one of these inactive satellites accidentally collides with one of the thousands of other space junk pieces orbiting our planet? It will result in a catastrophic disaster. We're talking about a crazy release of toxic substances that could wreak havoc on our poor Earth. Space junk can mess things up for scientists trying to make important discoveries. It's not just floating around aimlessly in space or posing a threat to Earth. It can hinder their chances of success. Even the moon has its fair share of junk, which Neil Armstrong definitely didn't encounter when he landed there in 1969. Think of it like this. Imagine you're an artist trying to create a huge painting. It's hard to do that if there's a bunch of old paints, brushes, and other stuff cluttering up your play area, right? Well, it's the same deal for scientists trying to set up camp and use new technologies for advanced missions and space exploration. They need a clean and organized space, just like you need a tidy work area. Otherwise, it's chaos. So here's the deal with space junk. It's not just about sending stuff up into the atmosphere. It's also about how far away we send it. You see, when satellites are sent over 22,000 miles into the atmosphere, it becomes a real problem to retrieve them and bring them back to Earth. And that leads to even more space junk floating around up there. Now, I know what you're thinking. How long will it take for space junk to become a major problem? Well, it might still be a few more years before it messes things up in outer space. But hey, that doesn't mean it's not a threat to satellites we have up there right now. Those poor guys are at risk of getting damaged, destroyed, or even leaking toxic stuff because of all that junk. 
So space debris isn't just a problem for space exploration, but it's also a problem for us Earthlings, even though it's floating thousands of miles above us. Space junk is like that annoying neighbor who throws trash out their window and it ends up in your backyard. Except instead of trash, it's releasing all sorts of chemicals into our atmosphere that are slowly destroying our precious ozone layer. It can even ruin future space missions. Imagine this, you're all pumped up to launch a rocket into space, but nope, space junk decides to crash the party. Not only does it mess up the launch, but it also adds more pollution to our already struggling atmosphere. And if things couldn't get worse, imagine a shooting star or meteor accidentally smacking into some space junk on its way to Earth. Boom! Millions of toxic particles raining down on us, further depleting the ozone layer. Plus, space debris is becoming a real problem for space missions. In 2022, we found some space debris hanging out on Mars. The Perseverance rover stumbled upon its own backshell, just chilling on the surface of Jezero Crater. They also spotted a random piece of a thermal blanket that might have come from the rover's descent stage. Also, human-made space debris actually smacked into the moon in 2022. It was probably some old rocket body from the 2014 Chang'e 5T1 mission, but nobody saw that coming. It left a double crater behind. The more space junk we have floating around in low Earth orbit, the higher the chances of a cosmic collision. These collisions are no joke. They've already caused some serious satellite damage. Even the ISS has to constantly maneuver to dodge space debris. But scientists seem to know how to clean up this orbital mess. They're planning to send space vehicles armed with nets, harpoons, and even robotic arms to capture and de-orbit all that junk. <laughs>